Uh, and thank you, Language World, for hosting this wonderful event. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Yes? Good. Wonderful. Is everyone awake? <laughs> OK, don't answer that question. Uh, if you didn't answer, that means you're asleep. OK. Um, it's, I think it's really wonderful for all of you to be here today. And we should really thank the organizers, Language World, for giving us an opportunity to refresh our thinking, to refresh our ideas, our methodology, and to give us some input. Uh, when I was first training to be a teacher, I won't tell you how long ago, uh, but my trainer described learning to teach as taking off in an airplane. Um, how many, you've all been on airplanes, I assume, most of you. When you board the airplane, uh, what, do you, what happens next? After you board the airplane, what happens? You fasten your seatbelt, and then you wait for everyone else to board. And then you wait for the plane to taxi. And then you wait until the takeoff spot is ready. And then you start to move very slowly. And you're thinking to yourself, maybe the first time, when are we going to take off? When are we going to start? And then eventually, we take off. And we're flying. And it's exciting. And it's wonderful. But after about two hours, three hours, four hours, how do we start to feel? Maybe a little bit bored, a little bit antsy. If we're the pilot, maybe we're running out of fuel. So we land, and we come back, and we get some more fuel so we can take off again. I like to think of these events as an opportunity for us to get more fuel so we can continue on our journey wherever we're going. So I really think we should, if you have a chance, when you leave today, talk to anybody from Language World outside. Just say thank you, um, because I know they put a lot of time and a lot of resources into making this happen. OK, um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, teaching nonfiction reading. How many of you teach reading? Raise your hand. <laughs> Wonderful, you're in the right room. Uh, how many of you, do you all teach nonfiction? <laughs> Most of us might. If you're not teaching nonfiction, you should, and I'll, we'll get to that in a second. But I was talking to many of you today. I talked to, who did I talk to? I wrote names down. You don't have to, you don't have to stand up when I call your name. Uh, I talked to Amy. I talked to uh, Sanhi. I talked to Kyok, Lila. I talked to Nina. And they talked about many of the problems they have when they teach reading. And one of the biggest problems, as we all know, is this. Do your students love English? <laughs> Some of them do, right? Some of them love English, and if we were speaking Russian in class, they would still learn English because they love it. Do some of your students hate English? Maybe we don't want to admit it, but some students really dislike English class. So we have some students who love it, some students who don't love it, and a lot of students in the middle. And my personal philosophy is that I want to try to get these students to like it more than they dislike it. And that's my, my mission in my classes, is to help those students feel more interested in what they're learning. So we have to find ways to build their interest. Um, as mentioned by Yumi, I work for National Geographic Learning, which is a part of Cengage Learning. And it's a really exciting uh, opportunity for me to learn about what National Geographic does. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but I do want to let you know about our mission as a, as a uh, learning organization. We do want to inspire our students to care about the planet because our students now, your students, maybe they are in grade one elementary school. What year will they graduate? Does anybody know? I know you're all English teachers because you're doing the math and it's taking some time. <laughs> Our students will graduate around 2030. Right? They will graduate from high school or maybe university. In 2030, will the world be the same as it is now? No, it won't. And we have a mission as teachers to help them care for what their world is going to be when they graduate in 2030. Another mission of National Geographic Learning is to bring the world to the classroom and the classroom to life. Are your students demanding? 
my students are demanding, I can tell very quickly if I'm doing a good job or not. They let me know. If I ask you, are your parents demanding? Yes, the parents of your students are very demanding. And I think students are very demanding and we can help them by making things as real and relevant as possible. Inside English for most of our students is only inside the classroom, correct? They leave the classroom, do they say English? Not so much. So we have a mission in our classroom to make it as real, as lively as possible. So when they graduate in 2030 and they go to the real world, they can start to use the English in a meaningful way. Okay, let's get back. Nonfiction reading. Um, let me ask you first, uh, look at the person sitting next to you. Look at the person sitting next to you. Say hello. Hello, hello. okay. This is, the, this is my regular joke. Do you like that person? Yes. Uh, okay. Don't answer if you don't like them. <laughs> just pretend you like them. That's the same thing we do with our students. A different question. Anyway, <laughs> pretend you like that person. And very, very quickly, I'm going to give you 20 seconds to define interest. Are you ready? Come up with a definition for interest. 20 seconds with your partner. Begin. Here's my definition of interest. It comes from a dictionary. I don't know about you, but I like that definition. <laughs> this being the key, right? Anything that's interesting, you want to find out more about it. And as teachers, if we can develop interest in our students, we can then teach them anything we want. My philosophy as a teacher has always been, how can I trick my students into learning? Because if the only reason my students are learning is because I say so, they are not going to learn very much. But if they are learning because they are interested, they are motivated, then I can feed them the things that help them find out more about what they want to learn. However, there's a problem. I read an article recently. I found it very interesting. It was a really interesting article. What do you think it was about? Online learning, I heard. Uh, teaching children. The fact is, you don't know. You can't know. It's impossible to know what interests me, just as I don't know what interests you. We think we know what interests our students, but really, do we know? And what interests this student may be different from what interests that student. So it's very difficult to just give a topic and expect all of our students to be, yes, teacher, this is interesting. It's some students like fashion, some like sports, some like dinosaurs, some like um, uh, make-believe stories. Every student is different. Therefore, I cannot rely just on the topic alone. It has become my job to generate that interest. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this article. Any guesses of where that might be? Wonderful. I heard space. I heard desert. I heard Mars. If you said Mars, you are correct. Okay. This is from uh, Mars. And when I saw this picture and I read the article, I was amazed. I was really interested. How, how, how? How do they do that? How do you get something from here to Mars and then get pictures back? To me, that was just fascinating. So I want to, um, I used to think that if you wanted to get something to Mars, you have a rocket, you point it at Mars, and you shoot the rocket, in my mind. <laughs> Turns out it's a lot more complicated very complicated. Mars is very far away. Very far away. And what we don't realize is that sometimes it's further away than other times. Sometimes here's Earth and here's Mars. Sometimes Mars is here. So the distance can vary a lot. Okay? And in order to get there, you have to do some very, very precise calculations 
We call it in English, threading the needle. Is threading a needle easy to do? Very difficult. And in fact, it is so difficult to get to Mars from Earth that you can only try it once every two years. And that time period, the window, once every two years, is only two weeks. Since we started exploring Mars, we have sent 59 missions to Mars. How many do you think have succeeded? Okay. 21. Okay. About one third have actually made it to Mars. And that shows just how difficult it is to get to Mars. Okay. Even if you have the timing right, still not easy. And you thought your commute to school was far, right? <laughs> Let's go backwards. Earth, the circumference of the Earth is 24,000 miles. The moon is 10 times further, 240,000 miles. And Mars can be at the closest 15 times further than the moon or 100 times plus further than the moon. A long way away. Now, even though it's really difficult to get to Mars, we don't just want to send probes and satellites to Mars. Some people actually want to go to Mars. But there's a problem. To get to Mars, we cannot send enough fuel to come back. So you can send people to Mars, but as they say in Virginia where I grew up, they ain't coming back. So when I read this article, it was very interesting. It's a program called Mars One. And Mars One is a mission to fly people to Mars. And it's possible because the people agree not to return. <laughs> Do you want to learn more? Yes. Okay. So, so there are people who want to go to Mars to start a colony. And let me tell you, this article told me how, it's, how it works. In 2011, experts from places like NASA and the European Space Agency got together and they made a design for a place to live on Mars. This is the interesting part. Last year, in New York City and in Shanghai, there were two events to find people, to choose people, to go to Mars. <laughs> and there were lots of applications. How many people do you think applied to go to Mars and never come back? Any guesses? 200,000 people. Okay. Which means there are 200,000 people who hate their jobs so much they don't want to come back to Earth. Okay. 200,000 people. So at this event in Shanghai and in New York City, they chose the people they want to send. Six teams of four people, that's 24 people, were chosen from 200,000 200, people. Now, how's the mission start? Next year, these people will start training in a desert or other place that's very difficult to live. And they will train together um, in groups. Maybe they will be in the desert, maybe they will be in the Antarctic, someplace very difficult. And they will spend months there. And then, in 2023, we will send rovers to Mars to build this habitat before the people arrive. Then, in 2014, during one of those windows that happens only every two years, the ship will blast off and travel to Mars. 
and the people will be in the ship for 210 days before they arrive on Mars. And that means in 2025, they land. When they land, what will they do? What do you think they will do first? Get out of the ship, take pictures, <laughs> call their, their loved ones. For the first two weeks, they will lie in a bed to recuperate, to recover from the journey. Their muscles will be weak and they need to get used to the gravity that's on Mars. So for two weeks, they do nothing. And then every two years after that, more groups of people will go to Mars and they will start their colony and they will not come back. Okay. Think about that for a second. I have some questions for you. Okay, I think maybe you have some ideas. Um, this time I want you to, to look around at somebody else. Look at somebody behind you or in front of you. Find a partner and discuss these questions. I'm going to give you three minutes to talk about it. After three minutes, I will raise my hand. If you see me raise your, my hand, you must raise your hand and stop talking. <laughs> Let's practice that one time. Great. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. You have three minutes to discuss this. You can talk in English or Korean. I don't care. <laughs> Begin. Okay. Put your hands down. Does anybody have an answer for number one? Would you be willing to go to Mars? Anyone want to share their ideas? I said I don't want to go because I don't, I don't think I can stay in the you know, rocky ship for 210 days. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. I have a prize for you. Uh, so this is a, a National Geographic magnet and pen. You could put it here. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Did anyone say they would be willing to go? I would be go. Uh, I would be willing to go if I'm not married, <laughs> and if I don't have kids, and um, if I didn't have any surgery on the appendix, then I would go. Mm. Yeah but I'm not, so I wouldn't go because of that reason. I might, I might feel lonely, so. That was an excellent answer. I have a prize for you as well. Here you go. Also a National Geographic pen. Here you go. Thank you. May, may I ask your name? Uh, Jessica. J Jessica? Yeah. Jessica, I liked her answer because she thought outside of herself, <laughs> and she thought, if I had these circumstances, maybe I would go. This is critical thinking, <laughs> right? Um, excellent. This is what we, are, we want our students to be doing as well. Fantastic. How about the next one? Thinking, feeling. Anybody want to share? Uh, what's your name? Claire says she would keep telling herself, I'll be okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, I'm sure you have many uh, different adjectives you might use to describe how you would be feeling. Okay. Let's, uh, I want to now uh, show you a video about Mars. Labeled the red planet for its fiery color, Mars has so far been too far away and dangerous for humans to explore. The alternative has been to build robots to aid scientists in their research. In 2004, two robot explorers, or rovers, called Spirit and Opportunity were sent to Mars. Their mission was to find signs of water. Spirit landed first after a seven-month trip. It was to explore an area scientists believed was once a lake. Opportunity landed three weeks later in another place with different rocks. These rovers can drive over rough ground and operate cameras and scientific instruments. They set out to work. Mars is important to scientists because it is close to Earth and similar in many ways. Mars has seasons with different kinds of weather. 
It also has a network of what looks like dried rivers and lakes. This has raised the question, was there once life on Mars? Most scientists hold a firm belief that all life needs water. To look for water, the robots carry equipment to measure the chemicals in rocks. As well as being equipped with solar power cells, the rovers also carried special cameras for scientists to record images of the planet's rocks. <coughs> After only two months, scientists had found what they were looking for. Opportunity found chemicals and patterns in the rocks that showed the area was full of water a long time ago. Scientists don't know when this happened or how much water there was, but the surprising discovery changed their ideas about Mars. Now they believe that the weather on Mars was once warmer, maybe warm enough to once have forms of life. In the following months, Spirit moved on to an area that may once have been a volcano, whereas Opportunity went on to study rocks that may have formed underwater. Today, scientists still aren't sure if life ever existed on Mars. They need more information to decide. The discoveries of the two Mars rovers answered some old questions, but they also brought up many new ones. Okay, interesting. Okay, now let me get out of this. Okay, now uh, we brought up critical, Jessica brought up critical thinking earlier, and I'd like to consider whether we should actually try to colonize other planets. What are the reasons there may be for colonizing other planets? What reasons there are against colonizing other planets? And I'd like you to look at your handouts because we have an article that talks about colonizing other planets. Do you see the article? Yeah. It's on page, is there a page number? No. no. Can I hold this up? Yeah. It looks like this. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So right now, read the article and here on your handout, put some reasons for colonizing and here are some reasons against. Sure. Okay. Uh, before you get too excited, I'd like to um, ask you, does any, can someone tell me a reason why we should colonize another planet? Does anyone have something? Yes, ma'am? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> well, not fantastic that we're in danger, but because the Earth could be in danger, maybe a comet will hit us. That's a great <laughs> answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone, ha anyone else have a, a, a reason why we should colonize other planets they'd like to share? Yeah. Oh, 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 uh, yes, yes. Humans have to be advanced their life. So they, I find the paradox. By, by exploration, we will push ourselves to develop new technologies, new ideas. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> What's the reason not to colonize a planet? Yes, ma'am. Mm, good. Too much time, too much money, and uh, it's too hard. Thank you very much. OK, these are all wonderful examples. If I gave you time, you could keep going. Uh, and I bet if I gave you more time, you could take this one, for example. There are other people's, uh, other animals or peoples there we shouldn't go. Maybe you could say, but that's a good reason to go. Right? So you can contact and learn and understand, right? So there's, this is a great opportunity to develop the topic, to develop different ways of thinking about the topic, all about critical thinking. Now, let me ask you a question. Before we started today, how many of you would say you are interested <laughs> in Mars or colonizing other planets. Anyone? Is that one of your favorite topics? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? No. 
So if I asked you if you wanted to read this, you would say, mm, I'm not interested. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. But after we, ta after we did some things, did you become interested? Did it become meaningful? So that's an important lesson for us, right? Topics alone are not enough. We have to do work as teachers to make it interesting. And any topic can be made interesting for our students. We already talked about that. Uh, you were interested after we did some work, but before that, no way. How did we warm up that activity? How did we get you, how did I try to get you interested? Wait, 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 wait. Tell somebody next to you because there's too many of you. <laughs> try to think of at least three ways I got you interested, okay? Talk to a partner. Okay. Uh, can anyone remember what I did to try to get you interested? Anything you noticed? Uh, 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 someone, I, I've, you guys talk too much. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Yes, ma'am? Can you ask about the interesting question related to, so if, if you can go, but you cannot back. Okay. So I, I asked you a question uh, about can, would you go if you can't come back? Okay. Why was that interesting? Uh, I've never th thought about that, but if I, if I come back and I want to go there or mm. not, I okay. see, this is a good chance to think about that. Okay, so you never thought about it in that way, yeah. right? Or I give you a, an option <laughs> that's either this or that, and it makes you think. Great. Yeah, good point to the interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I, I, uh, as you mentioned, I try to do things, I try to be energetic, try to surprise you, try to make you put yourself in that same situation before we got to the article. Um, why is this important? We already know it's important because our students are not interested. Maybe some students are interested, but not everyone is interested in the same topic. Why else is it interested? And why else is it important? Because we have to learn. Sorry? Because we have to learn. Because we need to learn, yes, <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, uh, or maybe what I can, I'm, I'm extending what you're saying. Uh, many uh, seminars, uh, lots of uh, methodology courses talk about uh, building on students' background knowledge, which is excellent. But sometimes our students have limited background knowledge. Um, some of our students, all they do is go to school, go home. If they're lucky, they go outside and play with their friends. So it's very challenging to build on background knowledge if they don't have any. So if we can build interest, that can help them then go in and learn about something, and that builds their background knowledge. Okay. Anything else to share? To survive. To survive? <laughs> Actually, very true. Okay. Uh, what do you mean to survive? And then that is uh, real things, and then we don't have a lot of resources. That's why. Yep. Okay. So uh, it's something. Something for for you, our, for my daughter and for my huh. sons, for, mm. and then. Yep. So learning is important. We need information mm -hmm. that can help us understand and be responsible uh, citizens, <laughs> right? Make informed choices um, when we vote. These type of things. Absolutely. Yes. Um, it's also important because of this. Surprising? No. Mm. If, you, if you think about it, oh yeah, it's true. I, I like to read novels, but I only read a few novels in a year. Every day I go to work, I'm reading nonfiction. Newspaper, nonfiction. What I watch on the internet, most of it, I hope, is nonfiction. So we have to train our students to work with nonfiction in English, um, and work with it in a critical way. What else? Are you familiar with the Common Core? Um, wherever you, th con Common Core is very controversial in the US, I think mostly for political reasons, but that's my opinion. Um, but uh, the Common Core is a set of standards adopted by 47 or so states in the US. So textbooks in the US um, use Common Core are focusing on deep processing of texts mm -hmm. and both fiction and nonfiction mm -hmm. from very early. Okay. 
Um, the reason why, um, one reason why, is that in the past, uh, the standards in the US focused on what's called a skills and strategies approach. Maybe you've heard of this. this and this is useful, it's good. Um, but quite often, that skills and strategy approach would start with a shared experience. So we're going to read a story about going to the beach. How many of you have been to the beach? Now, what that means in practice is that everyone who's been to the beach is going to do better than someone who has not gone to the beach. And in that skills and strategies approach, we quite often we would level our students, but that often meant that we would keep students here. They wouldn't improve. The Common Core says, okay, let's start the text is the basis. Everyone has to work with the same text. Everyone has to understand the text, find the information from the text, develop critical thinking with information from the text, so that everyone has the same access to the information. And our job as language teachers is to help improve their English and design tasks that are at the appropriate level to help them. What else? This. Do you know this word? Slump. Slump. It's a funny word. Um, there's lots of, in the past uh, five to ten years, there's been lots of talk about the fourth grade slump. And I bet you can guess what that means. Our students in grade one, grade two, especially in language arts, whoa, improvement, great, wonderful. Fourth grade, boom. Or maybe it's more like this, and then And uh, it's most common at fourth grade. And you see that in the United States, Australia, Canada, UK. You probably find it here in Korea as well. It, those of you who have children probably recognize it. And one of the reasons from the research is that when students are in grade one, two, and three, all the readings are mostly fiction, fiction mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And it's fun and it's wonderful. <laughs> and then we get to fourth grade and we introduce nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And it becomes difficult and academic and longer. Mm -hmm. So students start to level off. Mm -hmm. It happens again in middle school when there's almost no fiction and everything becomes nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And it happens a lot at freshman uh, year mm -hmm. when they've moved from outside of a, uh, a very assessment-oriented system mm -hmm. to a system where they're being asked to think critically about information. So we need to not only teach nonfiction but generate our students' interest in nonfiction to help them overcome these slumps. It's also important, I believe, because this. If we can generate interest, our teaching becomes much more enjoyable, and learning becomes much more enjoyable as well. Okay. Uh, there's lots of other reasons. I thought of some earlier, but now I've forgotten them. Um, if I remember, I'll tell you in a bit. OK, so what are the five tips? <laughs> That's what you're here for. Um, I think you've already noticed some of these already. This one is very important. I think our students, our young learners especially, are very good at reading people. And they know if you're not interested, they know it right away. And even if you're not interested, you need to pretend you're interested. <laughs> right? Um, because if you're not interested, they turn off. Oh, they don't care, why should I care? So we have to be enthusiastic about the topic. That means we have to do some extra work sometimes. Maybe it means reading the article. Maybe it means going on the internet, finding information. Finding something that, that we think is interesting. Um, you can share your own interest in any topic by doing these kinds of things. Storytelling. Michael, you just told us stories are no good. No, stories are wonderful. Human history is a story. Your life is a story, and it's all nonfiction. So you can share your own experience about a topic and how it became meaningful to you, or something that happened in your life that relates to the topic. Um, anecdotes, short, again, short, short uh, things that happened to you. 
Um, for example, I'm not particularly interested in fashion, but I have to teach an article on fashion. Maybe I tell students a story about my, um, I went to the mall to buy a shirt. I don't like to go shopping. <laughs> so I went to the store I always go to, to buy a shirt. So I found a shirt, it was the right size, I bought it. But when I got home and put it on, it was very tight, <laughs> very tight. And I was confused. And then I looked at the, eight, the label and it said, the size was my size, uh, say medium, Asian slim fit. <laughs> I am not Asian or slim or fit. So I learned a lesson about fashion. And then they can start thinking about clothes, share their own experience, then we do read an article about fashion. Um, or sometimes you may have the interaction at the beginning of the class. Students, I did not have lunch today. I'm really hungry. Um, any suggestions for what I could eat? A sandwich? That's too much. I don't have time. Something small. Uh, it's, I, I don't have enough money for that. Cheap? Anything else? I don't want that. I want something sweet. Chocolate. Oh, I, I want chocolate. I love chocolate. I've always really liked chocolate. Every, you know, I, uh, I don't need other snacks, but I love chocolate. Cheap chocolate, not expensive chocolate. <laughs> I love M&Ms, I love Twix. Um, do you know where chocolate comes from? Okay. Some of you, uh, and, and that's a plant, and some of you mentioned places, Africa, Mexico, oh, you're right. Um, maybe I list those on the board. And I say, now open your books to page 42. <laughs> Read this article about chocolate. <laughs> and check to see if your predictions were correct. Okay? That's a way to generate interest, okay? By sharing something about yourself. And for me, that's my philosophy of tricking students <laughs> and to be interested in something. Um, as mentioned earlier, your own enthusiasm comes through um, and, I'll go back here. and uh, I think even that story about chocolate um, students do care about you we they students do have emotions and we can use that <laughs> to manipulate them to learn okay tip number two make the material relevant to students now often we make the mistake of thinking this means directly relevant in which case, a mission to Mars is not relevant to my, my students, any of my students, right? They're not going to go to Mars tomorrow. So how to make it relevant? I involve the learners in the issue. Put students in the situation. How would they feel or act? Um, any of you who are, uh, did any studies or reading about advertisements, or if you pay attention to politics, it's all about emotion. We are emotional animals. <laughs> and if we can appeal to our students' emotions somehow by putting them in the situation, just like I did, you're going to Mars, you can't come back, how do you feel? Mm. That will make it relevant mm. to their emotions, not necessarily to their lives. Localize the content or situation. Uh, this is important uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, again, our materials can, uh, there are no perfect materials, right? Yeah. There is no book, no video, no program that's 100% perfect because each of us is different. So we have to find ways to make them appropriate for our students. And localizing is a, a really good way to do that. Localizing does not mean rewriting the text but it means how do I make the text content match into a local situation? Okay. Um, let me give you some examples of that. The, the many reasons to do that because students very quickly recognize this is something that's familiar or close to me. Also, uh, it's very important because we want to make English part of who they are. 
we want our students to have ownership of English. And too often, if we focus only on non-local context, this is the US, this is Australia, students, their connection to English gets further and further apart because it's not related to my situation. So as teachers, we have to help them make that connection. Now I'm challenging myself, how do I make a mission to Mars localized? <laughs> as a teacher, maybe I find out about the first South Korean astronaut. I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to do some research to find out, right? Yeah. Maybe I find information about Koreans uh, uh, moving or immigrating. That's also going somewhere where they, don't, they will never come back, right? Um, there's all sorts of ways I can do that if I'm creative. Okay. Um, and then, of course, getting the students to actually give opinions is important. It can be difficult for students to give opinions. Now, if you appeal to their emotions, often it's much easier to help them with their opinions. But I know that our students can be reluctant to talk, right? Not because they're shy. Koreans are not shy at all. <laughs> I've been to karaoke with Koreans. They're definitely not shy. But they are often afraid in class to give the wrong answer. So when I want to get students' opinions, I ask them, what do you think? They go, hmm. So I may start by giving them, here are some emotions. Choose three that you think you would feel if you were doing this, right? Um, or um, if the question in the text is, what do you think about colonizing other planets? Maybe I change the question which of these st statements do you agree with <laughs> about colonizing other planets, A, B, or C? Um, and then next time or next semester I have, uh, how do you feel about um, colonizing other planets? A, B, and C is a blank. So they can write their own. Okay? So we can step by step give them that confidence okay, to get there. And I find most students, if you push them, push them that way, give them support, but push them, they can have lots of things they can say. And sometimes, um, if I want students to produce language, talk or write, instead of asking them, write about your opinion, I will say, here are two options. You are A, you are B. Your opinion is A, your opinion is B. Write about it or talk about it. After we talk about it for five minutes, now switch. You were A, now your opinion is B. Talk about it. So at that point, at some stage, the student has talked about their opinion rather than having to choose one. Okay, critical thinking is important. Um, critical thinking sounds difficult, sounds hard, um, but I don't think it's that hard. Um, I think, I think, I think, my students actually like to think if I challenge them the right way. Um, I, it's all about finding the appropriate level of challenge for them. So I can get students talking by posting a controversial issue and debating it. But again, debating can have many different ways, right? I may have students, uh, instead of debating, have them survey their classmates. What do you think about this controversial issue? Do you think A, B, or C? and they may create some graphs or charts to show what's the popular opinion, say, in the room. Uh, comparing similar situations or stories. I told you my story about, my embarrassing story about buying a shirt. Maybe I have them s compare sto or uh, share stories about buying something. Um, I told you that I wanted to eat chocolate. Maybe I have you talk about what do you like to eat when you're hungry? What's your favorite snack? Um, brainstorming is a great way to get students thinking critically. Um, for example, uh, Jessica's wonderful example of 
she went ahead and thought of reasons why she would go. Okay, I could ask students, okay, whether you think you would go or not, under what circumstances would you go? Work with your partner to list out those circumstances. Um, cultivate anticipation. Um, anticipation. Anticipate. When you read a good book, a good story, you watch something on TV that's interesting or exciting, there's always that moment where you go, what's going to happen next? In our classes, whatever we're teaching, we want to cultivate anticipation, where students don't know what's going to happen next. And this can be done in a number of ways. One, create a need to read or a need to watch or a need to listen. This is important. This is, again, tricking students to do something. If the only reason students are reading or watching or listening is because I said so, good luck, very difficult. You have to give them a reason to do it. So having students make predictions. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think you're going to read about? What do you think you will listen to? Then they think they know. They write down some predictions. I say, check with your partner. Partner, what do you have? OK, yeah, same, different, OK. Mm, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then I say, OK, we're going to watch the video. Check your predictions. And they go, OK, 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 yeah. Do you want to watch? Yeah, yeah, teacher, show us, show us, show us, yeah. <laughs> like, are you sure? Yes, yes, show us the video. We want to listen to English, right? because they're trying to check their predictions, because they want to be right. Um, give students only part of the story. Um, many readings today often have a listening section. You may have them books closed. You've done some pre-work to get them interested. Then you listen to the reading, but you only listen halfway. Then have them predict the other half then have them open their books to read the full article and check their predictions. Um, if you're watching something on a video and there's a moment of high drama, I will pause the video. And what do students do? <laughs> right? And then that's a great opportunity to have them produce language. Talk to somebody else. What do you think is going to happen? Um, or making a dramatic introduction. Maybe my saying, I didn't have lunch. I'm really hungry. That was dramatic to create this sense of something's going to happen. Number five, present the topic in a variety of ways. Um, this is really important. Uh, um, we talk here about a multimodal approach. Modal means mode or way, a multi-way approach. This is hugely important for today's learners because uh, they, English, they will not see English only as an article. They will watch YouTube. They will see English. They will watch movies. When they grow up and they take a job at some Samsung, they will have to write these reports with graphs and charts and pictures. You have to give them a lot of different types of, uh, um, of input. Videos are hugely important. Uh, there, many people talk today about a new skill called viewing, the ability to view videos as a, as a very important life skill. Um, even today, I was thinking, uh, uh, I'm growing a beard because a friend of mine is raising money in November for men's health. And in November, you're supposed to only have a mustache. I know how to grow a beard, but I don't know how to grow a mustache. Um, so today, I'm thinking I should watch a video on YouTube about how to trim a mustache. Um, last, year, or last year, at our company party, uh, we had to dress in costumes. And we had a bow tie. I don't know how to tie a bow tie. I go to YouTube to find out how to do it. Um, so helping our students be able to, to f access information in this way is very important. And this morning I asked myself, in the past, if I wanted to learn to how, how to tie a bow tie, how did I do it? 
ask a friend, or maybe I went to the library. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really interesting uh, how we're changing our access information. So videos are important. Visuals, visuals, visuals. Uh, visual literacy is hugely important. The ability to read an image is as important as reading words. They're important for us as a tool to motivate our students. Here are some images. What do you think is happening here? What do you see? It's important because everything they see now on the internet is very, very visual as well. Um, use group work and pair work to have students talk about a topic. What do you know about this topic already? Um, you can use lectures or debates to get students thinking about it. And all those are done before you actually go into the reading. Okay. Um, I have about 10 minutes left, so I have to show you books that I want to sell to you. <laughs> Uh, this is the book that the example came from today. This is Reading Explorer. This is a, a book for middle school or above. It's used in many universities as well. Um, very visual. So those topics, again, the visuals can make it interesting, but we as teachers have to help guide students into that. Um, often we'll talk about this, what do you think is happening, what do you see, these warm-up questions. But again, as teachers, do some research. Find a way to make, connect it to you, then you can connect it to your students. Um, here you see some of those visuals. A tr the trip of a lifetime. Immediately as a teacher, I think I will introduce this by talking about my last trip. In May, I went to Turkey, and this happened, this happened, this happened, before I opened the book. Um, here's mystery on Everest. Maybe there's a mystery on, what's the famous mountain here? So, so, on that mountain. <laughs> Maybe there's a mystery there. If there's something I can find, uh -huh. I can use that to introduce a topic. Or I can talk about uh, mountain climbing. Um, here is a meteorite hunter. Remember there was a meteorite that went into Russia, a very big one. Yeah. Maybe it was last year. I go on YouTube, I find that, and I uh, show that to start. Um, and uh, this is, uh, very quickly, I want to show you a video from National Geographic. Share the discoveries. And join them in seeking solutions to today's most pressing problems. Together, we built one of the largest nonprofit scientific organizations in the world. Funding more than 10,000 cutting-edge projects. Unraveling ancient mysteries. Protecting wildlife in wild places, observing cultures and languages, and tracking the forces that move our planet. And our journey continues. National Geographic is expanding its global grant programs, working with partners to find and fund the world's best. Together, we can shape the future and connect the next generation to the pulse of the planet. Okay, that's what we hope that National Geographic can bring into your classrooms, that we can inspire our students to be the explorers, the scientists, the leaders of tomorrow. And we can also try to be creative to introduce that nonfiction to our students. Um, this is a great one about uh, the original bungee jumpers in Papua New Guinea. They have vines and they jump from a tower. It's a great video. Go on YouTube, look at it. It's amazing what these people do. Um, here are some graphics um, that you'll find in Reading Explorer. I was looking at the Samsung annual report looks very similar. Um, we can have students actually present information visually. A lot of teachers now are taking advantage of students who have smartphones in the class. Mm -hmm. Student creates a presentation, presents the presentation, 
their partner records their presentation on the smartphone. The teacher has created a classroom YouTube group. The students upload their videos to the YouTube group. Other videos, other students can now watch those videos and leave comments. All right, five minutes left. Thank you very much.